But does this affect one's philosophies about mortality if, in fact, access is denied or, you've, or death is dealt with euphemistically, Tony? Well, I, I mean, I'm, I'm shocked by the, the poll you've just conducted, so I'm a bit nervous about making any, uh, any predictions. Well, I'm not going to end the program because <laughs> <laughs> this is we got it wrong. <laughs> Um, I think it's true that there's a certain kind of uh, reticence about discussing death. I think um, we don't seem to be showing much, but uh, I, th I think in ordinary life it's certainly not greatly talked about. And I know that from personal experience in some cases um, that when people are dying there's an enormous reluctance to speak to them about the fact that death is imminent. When my father died, I... Um, uh, he, that was in Sydney, and I said to him, uh, when it was clear he would be dead in a few days' time, I said, well, this will be the last time I'll see you, and I kissed him goodbye. And my mother was horrified uh, at my having brought that topic to bear on, on the thing, uh, and she was really put out. And uh, I think it's probably the case that people just do keep very quiet about that in those sorts of situations. It's interesting, isn't it? Because the person who is very close to death and knows it probably wants to talk about it. Yes, I know? think that's right. Yeah, I, th I think Dad was pleased I said it. But, yeah. uh, but I think there is this very strong reserve associated with that. At least from my experience, it might be quite different with other people. Amanda? Uh, well, I was thinking death has become so medicalised that any... Uh, with the retreat of religion, particularly in a country like Australia, there are now no standard or traditional rituals around dying. Um, only the tubes and the hospital, or the hospice maybe. <coughs> um, but there's a movement afoot, as they say. Uh, Australians are very innovative about civil and secular ritual. And there is a movement afoot to think about this and to devise secular rituals about dying both before and after, um, that suit the individual. And uh, hospices are becoming, in particular, very receptive to all kinds of innovations, um, where dying people can pretty much request whatever they like, and the family can conduct whatever rituals they like, so that one uh, relative of mine, in fact, asked that her coffin be brought into her room while she was dying, and that the family decorate it in front of her, mm. particularly the children. And that became a kind of ongoing party that went on for days. And, a, a sort of pre-death wake. <laughs> a pre-death wake. And um, she enjoyed it, they enjoyed it, um, and it became a kind of ceremony. I want to come back to ceremonies from the 21st century, but it's a thought suddenly occurs to me. You talk about the medicalising of death. Mm -hmm. We also use the massive technologies of medicine to avoid it mm -hmm. as long as possible. I've had a lifelong interest in the mummification pro processes of ancient Egypt. But where I have coffee in Sydney, I'm surrounded by women who have mummified themselves <laughs> while alive. <laughs> it's quite extraordinary, the number of women in Double Bay who walk up and down showing clear signs of mummification. <laughs> and it doesn't come cheap. <laughs> Julian, ritual, are we learning to create... No, first of all, should there be secular rituals for this rite of passage to help the bereaved as well as the, the ex-human? Um, and if so, are we starting to learn what, what they might be? Well, I, I think rites of passage are very important. <clears throat> Whether you have secular or religious rituals, you need rituals of some sort. You need to mark the occasion. And there are plenty of non-religious occasions that people mark. I mean, the 21st birthday used to be one of the major rites of passage. It had no religious connotations, whatever. Um, I think now it's the 18th birthday because you get a licence. But again, no religious overtones. But people want to mark the occasion. I see nothing wrong with the idea of a, um, celebrating, noting, commemorating... Uh, things like birth, death and marriage, which are at least two of them, two of the certainties of life. Um, seems a really good idea. Tony? Oh, I mean, just a, a stray thought occurred to me in this connection of um, recently in this city, the um, Catholic Archbishop, Dennis Hart, whom I won't name, uh, <laughs> issued a uh, promulgation that um, commemorating the life of, of the dead person at a uh, 
Catholic Church service uh, was to be uh, ruled out, you know, that people were there to pray for the soul of the deceased and so on, and he was um, outraged, apparently, by the uh, fact that people like, like to make speeches about what the person's life had amounted to, going back to your earlier question, and play some music that was significant for the dead person and so on. And I thought that showed an outrageous misunderstanding of how the church should deal with these sorts Which of Which is odd from the Catholic Church, because they're usually right up there with the, with the zeitgeist, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> you must give me some examples, sir, Philip. <laughs> <laughs> Amanda, rituals. I think you've, what, you've described an extraordinary one, which I've never heard no, it's in my good, life. No, it's a good one, isn't Decorate it? Decorate um, the coffin. I think one of the things we've lost with um, the development of secularism is a sense of ceremonial time. You know, time is just constantly flowing. You know, we don't even have Sunday as a special day. I'm all in favour of Sunday, no shopping on Sunday, simply as a, as a way of marking a pause in the working week should have nothing to do with religion in my mind. So we have no ceremonial time, we have no sense of actually going into a zone um, where we reflect and we rest. Uh, and ritual is all about getting together um, and going into some other space, some other zone that has some other kind of meaning and fullness other than just industrial time. Industrial time is just work, 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 and it's also future time. It's always oriented towards goals and bottom lines and planning and, um, you know, the, the entire stock market is geared around future time and futures trading, and it's hectic and it's accelerated. So I think we need to rethink the whole idea of slowing down and forms of ceremonial time, and that has nothing to do with religion. You know, we are, in fact, witnesses to a a ceremony on an absolutely regular basis, tragically regular, and that involves an unpopular war in Iraq. And what we do now is every death has to be dealt with culturally and militarily and politically. Mm -hmm. we're, you know, we're not encouraged to have contrary views on the war, but we come together to celebrate the soldiers who die in it. Now, OK, it comes out of an Anzac tradition as well. Mm. But its, its function these days is, I think, quite politically brutal. Would you agree, Jim? I, I agree completely. Um, the, whatever ritual you have associated with a person's death, I think, is essentially private in the sense that it's for the family and those who are close to them and those who will actually miss them. Um, the idea of having the politicians turning up for photo opportunities at the death of a soldier is noble in one sense, but as it is repeated, it begins to look cynical. And I think that's, I mean, if, if I, you know, I mean, I've experienced the death of my brother when he was 20. If he had died in combat, um, if he had died in combat and the politicians had muscled in and tried to take the limelight in the funeral service, I would have been outraged. Uh, I mean, it's an appalling, a terrible, frightful, unspeakable thing to lo lose someone who is younger than you and related, uh, and to have the commemoration of such an event hijacked by politicians or hijacked by anyone for reasons unconnected with that person's life, I think is disgraceful. And yet we had a huge secular ceremony in this country which was conducted by a politician, which I found one of the most moving experiences of my life, and I submit our collective life, and that was when Kevin Rudd, whatever happened to him, said sorry. Mm, mm. Now, that, but that was not marking a death. I think, that, I think sorry day was fantastic. I agree with you completely, but that was not marking the death of an individual. It's a different it was ceremony. was marking, to some extent, the death of a culture or the attempt to kill one off. OK, but I, I think the metaphor doesn't stretch that far. I don't think it's a problem. No, but I'm talking because about secular ceremonies. I understand that. And secular ceremonies can be, uh, you know, terrific. And, but it's the nature of the ceremony and who participates. That, the, the sorry day on the 13th of February 2008, would have been meaningless if it hadn't been the Prime Minister. The very point of it was that he was speaking for the entire country. I think it's a little different when a private expression of grief is taken over for political purposes. Another quick poll. How many people here tonight were affected, deeply affected by 
Sorry, Dave. Well, once again, but that's not a surprising result in not this really. case, is it? On the, on the uh, uh, ceremonies about the, return, the returned uh, dead from uh, Afghanistan, um, it certainly has a powerful political uh, ambition, that whole thing. It isn't just uh, getting the politicians some spotlight, though it is partly that. Uh, it's also um, an attempt to paper over the fact that the war is incredibly controversial uh, and that although these individual soldiers who were killed, um, it's very sad that that's happened, there are thousands of people killed in Afghanistan whom we're not not just not commemorating, we're by and large ignoring. And we will and never know how many yeah. died in Iraq. A million, a million is the latest figure. A million yeah, people yes. died, a million civilians have died in Iraq. Now, if you think those two wars, as I do, uh, are unjustified wars, morally unjustified wars, not just tactically unfortunate, um, then these sorts of celebrations, admitting everything about the sadness of these young men, um, have, that, have a political message which I find repellent. I mean, I mm. think it's the message that we are not going to think about these important matters of okay. death. I want to change the direction. Two things happened to me on the way here. One was the crocodile coming out of the, the Yarra. The other was two people who came up to me at Mascot when we were going through the airport security system. And they wanted to talk to me about suicide. It was the anniversary of their son's suicide. He committed suicide on his birthday, 29. And today was the anniversary of a, of a death day as well as a birthday. And we stood there for a while just talking about that form, that ethical conundrum that society, I think, handles so badly. Can we look at that? I'd like to know your attitudes philosophically to the right for someone to commit suicide and to social, political attitudes to it. Amanda? Are you talking about euthanasia or no, suicide? No, I'm talking about... This, apparently this young man, there was no hint, he bought a new pair of shoes shortly before he killed himself. He had a job he loved. Every, no one had the slightest idea. But suddenly, for whatever reason, he can commit suicide. Now, I've had elderly friends who have chosen to euthanise themselves one way or another, and I've had uh, friends who decided their careers were over. You know, they didn't have a, a major medical problem, but that was enough. You know, they'd done their dash. What's your attitude? to suicide as a choice? Well, my attitude is superfluous once the deed is done. I mean, it's ridiculous to make it a crime, is all I can say. It's, it's, um, it's a tragedy in a young person. It's usually got rational reasons in an older person. You look for the failures of support systems maybe when a young person suicides and you might try and work to correct these. Um... Uh, the suicide of a young person is a catastrophic event for their family and friends, there is no doubt about that. But I think suicide generally, at whatever age, is something which I, I can respect and understand a person's choice to do that. You know, we value autonomy very highly in our society and suicide is the ultimate expression of an autonomous choice. You know, um, some, someone once said, um, suicide is a man's way of saying to God, you can't fire me, I quit. Mm. Tony? Uh, yes, I, I think all, an awful lot of suicide is, is very sad, and particularly younger people, as you say. Um, and I think that quite often uh, s people who suicide are really in a bad way mentally and psychologically. They've got not the rational route to this uh, decision. So one would have to be very careful about the cases, I think. But I do think that there can be cases in which um, suicide is a morally reasonable uh, thing to do. And I think that um, it, the... Uh, obvious cases are those cases where people are in dreadful, unpalliable pain okay, and they now, want let's to die. Se let's segue now into assisted suicide. Let's mm. segue yeah, now yeah. into an area where the law has very strong attitudes mm. and it's currently, of course, uh, once again in this country, an urgent topic. Yeah. As a lawyer and as a human being, assisted suicide 
voluntary euthanasia, whatever you want to call it. Well, I'll try to be a human being first. <laughs> I, I would say that suicide is always a morally justifiable decision, however irrational it may seem to others. To the individual involved, I would never, ever criticise their moral choice um, to decide that their life is going to end. Um, it follows inevitably that I think that assisted suicide ought to be legal. And frankly, you know, I was involved in a case um, about 2003, I think, where the public advocate was arguing for the right to withdraw a feeding tube that was inserted through the abdominal wall into a woman's stomach. She'd been in a permanent vegetative state for 10 or 15 years. There was no possibility that she would ever have anything like a life, except she was organically alive. And the argument was... Our argument was that it was uh, lawful to withdraw that feeding tube. Dennis Hart, incidentally, intervened and opposed uh, the mm -hmm. making of that order. Even, we, we won the case, and so the feeding tube was withdrawn, which meant that she died, essentially, of dehydration over the course of the next week and a half. I think that's a dreadful way to have to assist suicide. I mean, you wouldn't let a dog die that way. If you decided a dog's life was over, you'd put them down cleanly and kindly. And I think we should be allowed to do it to human yes. beings. Who Amanda, do you agree? Absolutely. I think euthanasia is one of the major battlegrounds of the secular state, like birth control, like abortion. Uh, it is about the autonomous individual's rights over their own body, full stop. Another poll. Those in favour of voluntary euthanasia here. Well, that's the biggest majority <laughs> we've had tonight. <laughs> Isn't it extraordinary, though, again and again in this society, and I suspect in many others, I think this also applies to drug laws, you get um, the, the, pub, the public are light years ahead of the political curve. Mm. Why is that? Mm. Marginal, marginal electorates, Philip. You know why that, why that is. It's all about... And because the Greens have their primary representation in the Senate, not in marginal electorates, they can afford to push this debate. I mean, yeah. the major parties can't afford to run the gauntlet of a few thousand votes, Christian votes, in a marginal electorate. They just can't afford to do it. And yet it's they can afford to be horrendously insensitive on the issue of uh, refugees. Mm -hmm. Yes. For the same reason. For, yes. That people yes. with strong religious views seem to be prepared to push out boat people and treat them miserably. On, on the, uh, stick up for God, Tony. Totally. <laughs> yes, I, I was about to stick up for God. Um, on the Christian vote thing, I mean, I'm a Christian who, who thinks that uh, voluntary euthanasia in certain circumstances is morally okay. I think that we need to distinguish between the, the inherent judgment on uh, um, assisted suicide, voluntary euthanasia, about its intrinsic morality, which I think is in certain circumstances, not others, okay. But then there is another question about how to implement it legally and in practice. And I think some of the people who oppose it don't oppose it on the grounds that they think it's intrinsically wrong, but on the grounds that they worry about how it can be legally implemented. Now, some people phonally worry about how it can be legally implemented because their real objection is an intrinsic objection, and I don't like that sort of deviousness. But there are real questions about how it should be implemented. I mean, the, the interesting thing is that we've now got at least three jurisdictions overseas in Holland, in Belgium, uh, and in Oregon, uh, which can be sort of case studies for how it's working. And there's controversy about how it works. My impression is that it seems to work pretty well. But, mm. but I think the people who worry about, you know, the, will the relatives put pressure on, will, and so on, uh, are, have got real worries that need to be addressed in their own terms. You need to make sure that the opponents don't derail the debate. If the debate is about voluntary euthanasia and they're mm. talking about involuntary euthanasia, mm. oh, yes, no. we're not meeting on the same track. No, I, I didn't exactly. mean that. I mean, I mean but, legislation for voluntary euthanasia. Mm. Exactly so. Yes. But, and their concern when you unpick it is, well, it may not be voluntary. Yes. Mm. And often people make out that elderly people like myself are unable to make rational decisions. Uh, That's what my family tell me all I, the time. Well, I think it's probably true in your case, yeah. but in my case, it's not. Uh, and I know several other cases where it's not. And, and, of course, you have to be careful about how these... But it's not beyond our wit, I think, to try and work that out. No. Another life and death issue, and it's one which has united you and I uh, over many, many years, uh, is, of course, re the refugee issue. Now, I saddled up on the, to, to, get, uh, to campaign for Rudd, getting the leadership and then the prime ministership. 
because I thought we'd cut a deal. We talked about uh, Bonhoeffer. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, well, as long as Bonhoeffer kicks in, if, you, if and when you're Prime Minister on the refugee issue, Julian, it is interesting that Bonhoeffer didn't. Bonhoeffer. I still regard Rudd as a friend, and I still have as much about him than I admire, but this really distressed me. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, and curiously, once Tony Abbott, the godbotherer, got into power as the leader of the coalition, he started banging on about people smugglers, and all of a sudden, all bets were off as far as the Labor Party was concerned, and they started taking a hard line as on they did, arrivals. As they did before under Beasley. Yeah. Indeed. Well, it, under Beasley, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a hard line. They just went along with what Howard was doing. Although we have to remember that Paul Keating, under, well, Jerry Hand under Paul Keating, introduced mandatory detention for boat people. Mm. So the Labor Party's not got an unblemished record in relation Paul to... Paul would insist it, that he wanted it there for quick processing, yeah. not for razor wire and mm. long-term incarceration. Didn't work out. Mm. Um, the, the, um, the, thing about, the thing about Bonhoeffer, which never really emerged clearly, is that he was himself a people smuggler. Yes. And it just seems that Rudd forgot that, and that's a real pity. But, you know, that's politics. You people, I mean, I thought the, the article in the monthly that um, Kevin Rudd wrote w made me really optimistic that we could get something fantastic if he came into power. And a number of the things he did measured up to that promise. But the later performance on boat people was awful. I'm not picking on you because you're a Catholic. <laughs> well, yes, I am. You are. Yes, yes, you are. Yes. That's not mince words here. It's no. your fault. Now, can you explain to me how people who profess Christianity, and we've had quite a few national leaders recently mm -hmm. in that category. Howard, uh, well, Beasley came out of a moral reality yeah, tradition. Yeah, mm. In fact, most of our national leaders have been at least notionally Christian, sometimes la noisily yeah. so. How can Christians on this life and death issue turn off their conscience? Well, I, lots of people turn their conscience off. I, one thing that ought to be said on behalf of God at this point is that an awful lot of the people who work very hard on behalf of refugees do come from Christian communities. Uh, there, are, there are a bunch of nuns in this, uh, this city who, who are terrific on supporting the refugees. The only lefties left right. are nuns and the odd Jesuit <laughs> intellectual yeah. and, and a couple of lawyers. Yeah, I know, I know. So, so there, is a, there is a constituency within the, the Catholic Church, certainly the one I know best, um, highly supportive of refugees. So what happens when these people are in political power? Uh, I think an awful lot of it is they're terrified of the outer suburbs of Sydney, I mean, uh, which are, you know, miles from any refugee centres and so on. But, mm. the, but, the, but they believe that they're going to lose these key seats unless they keep standing up and saying, this is my country and I determine who comes and all this stuff. Uh, it's absolutely repellent, I think, and I don't know how a man like... Tony okay, Abbott Amanda, squares it with his conscience. Can you explain this to me? Well, yes, John Howard. Right. <laughs> oh, well, we don't have to say any more. <laughs> well, we had a long time civilised consensus between the major parties, and when you have that, a long time negotiated social consensus, when one person shatters that, it takes years to rebuild it. Mm. I feel another poll coming on. <laughs> How many people here tonight believe in personal survival after death, some sort of life after death? Greatly outnumbered. The pessimists among you, let's confirm this. How many of you would regard yourself as agnostic? Pretty big. And how many of you are lost causes to God? <laughs> on which side? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, that's interesting. I'm, I'm, this is radio, so this is silly, but basically we've had massive majorities mm. on everything tonight, but there, it's an interesting debate. It's split up. Mm. Yeah. Mm. OK, well, look, it's, this is a very intriguing night, and what we're going to do is keep doing it after we wind it up as a, um, as a radio program because we're going to do questions and they'll be taped and your responses will be taped as well. But I found this a really interesting night because each of you have been very candid, very open, very personal. You haven't been euphemistic. And uh, I think, well, I've had a great time and I hope the audience has as well. Ladies and gentlemen.
I would also uh, like to thank the Wheeler Centre for bringing us all together. It's uh, an interesting venue. As I said, it looks like it's going to masticate us all, but so far it has not ground its giant jaws. It's the BMW Edge at Federation Square, and this has been Late Night Live on ABC Radio National and our plethora of intergalactic platforms, none of which I fully comprehend. Uh, it's time, if you're a Radio National listener, to stick around for the news, and we will see you again tomorrow. Thank you. That was good. Now, what we're going to do... What we're going to do is one microphone. Is there another, or have you got to do all the work? One microphone. If you, it's all right, you can leave. It doesn't cost extra. Um, <laughs> Spike Milligan once told me he had this great idea for theatrical events. He said, you got in for nothing, but you had to pay to get out. <laughs> and if you wanted to go early, you had to pay a lot. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, put your hand up if you'd like uh, the microphone. Front row centre. Thank you. Uh, my mother died three weeks ago yesterday. I didn't go to her funeral because that is back in Poland. It happened that my two daughters who were in Europe at that time could represent me. And I'm a writer myself, biographer, but it was so hard for me to write an obituary, to say farewell to her. I can accept that she died, but I can't accept that she doesn't exist. Even my older daughter tells me, Mom, I believe in an energy like one of the uh, of like you Amanda, said. Yeah. But I, ca I can't. I just want to find a way to cope with this. It's so fresh for me. I'm a poetess myself. I public two books about, po about death and life. And I'm waiting for a time, for a moment, and I can sort of write about my mother and get rid of it. But at the moment, I can't, and I need some help. That's a very beautiful thing to say. It Thank is you. a statement rather than a question. I think we all Can understand. Can I respond it. to that, though? You see, I think by the passion with which you spoke, you show that she still lives on in your mind and in your children's mind and no doubt in your sister's minds. That's, that's the way you keep someone alive after they're gone, is remembering them and remembering their real living spirit. That's the way you remember them. That's the way they stay alive. And that's a sort of eternity, isn't it? However it's, long it lasts. It's, it's a sort of immortality. I don't know yeah. whether it goes for eternity. It depends on how long you plan to live. Yes, there's a gentleman with a beard, and I always feel comforted when I see gentlemen with beards. Yes. Uh, my name is Rodney, Rodney Sam. Sam. I'm a humanist and a doctor. I've seen many, many people die. I'm not the least bit afraid of death, possibly because of that experience. Uh, what I have learned as a doctor is that to die well, it's immensely important that you accept the reality of death uh, as long as possible before it actually is going to happen. And that, of course, opens up the space for people to talk about death within the family, within friends. How often have I seen people visiting a dying patient and what they talk about is the weather and what happened at the football last week. They don't talk about the things that humanly matter. I'd just like to say that my ideal for death is that I will attend my own wake with all my friends and that requires me to have a planned death and I think that is a very important idea. Can we all come? <laughs> I mean, it sounds terrific. <laughs> no, good. I agree completely, Rodney. Uh, I agree completely, but you and I have agreed for a long time on these matters. <laughs> and Rodney, I've thought about this all my life. I've rehearsed dying, I've had, you know, and I've had a few near-deathbed experiences. And you're right, if you've thought about it, if you've prepared yourself for it, and those around you, it's, uh, it can be quite an amusing time. And remember Jack Kevorkian. Jack Kevorkian uh, had this really interesting device where the, there would be a, a saline drip into the arm of the patient who had expressed a wish or intention to die shortly. Um, they can then have a party, friends, a bottle of scotch, whatever they want. And at the moment they choose. They push a button and the saline is replaced with a coma-inducing drug and shortly afterwards automatically is replaced by a death-inducing drug. Okay. I cannot think of many better ways to go, although to cease upon the midnight without pain strikes me as pretty, pretty I mean, good. Many, Philip, many, Philip, many of us would think the Bill yeah. Snedden choice was probably... Was, 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 <laughs> 
I don't know if that was a choice. All the timings, everything. <laughs> I, I can't resist a story in connection with this machine of uh, Kevorkian's. I, I was at a, a, a talk in Hobart a few years ago that Philip Nitschke gave, and uh, in the course of the talk, Philip was um, uh, telling us about a new machine he had invented for doing various things, a very complicated machine, which would kill the person painlessly and so on. But he began the talk by um, uh, trying to start the machine he had on the uh, table to show the uh, overhead projections and so on. And all that would come on was propaganda for the University of Tasmania. <laughs> and this came on and came on and came on and eventually a technician turned up and did things. And Philip got started and then he'd get to a good point and the propaganda would come up again. <laughs> I couldn't resist saying in, in, the, in the question time, you know, um, this looks pretty alarming for your own death machine, uh, Philip. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've been a supporter of Phillips for, forever, and as I think I'm one of the patrons of the Walsh yes. Youth and thing. And he had a big windig in the National Gallery, and no, no, the museum, that new strange mm -hmm. museum which looks like this, in, in Canberra. And all the members came down, they all came down in buses. These people are getting on a bit. This is one of the older audiences. I have never seen a happier crowd. They sat there all night. I had a great night celebrating the prospect of a decision to die. Yes. Mm. Yes. Mm. Sir, no, madam. Hi, uh, I just wanted to raise the concept of selflessness. I actually don't believe in selflessness at all. I think that everybody is a selfish person in some way or another because even if you are thinking of what you leave for your children or a legacy that you leave behind you in a piece of work or your legend living on, in each thing that you do, it's because it makes you feel good that you have helped somebody else. I just wondered what the panel had to say with regard to that. You taught Peter Singer, didn't you? <laughs> I did teach Peter Singer, he yes. You ignored all your teachings. No, not all of them, quite a lot. But he and Dawkins, and your other best friend, Peter and Richard Dawkins, would argue that empathy and this sense of selflessness mm. is, is driven by the evolutionary process. Yes, it may well be driven by the evolutionary process, but the claim that nobody acts from selfless motives, if, if, if it's a descriptive claim, is just psychologically false, and it's uh, false in common sense terms. I mean, we know numerous cases in which people sacrifice themselves for other people. Uh, even up in, to and including their lives. Mm. Up to and including their lives, but even in small ways. You know, mothers and fathers getting up in the dead of night for that crying brat night after night. Uh, now, this questioner will say, oh yes, but they're really only doing it for their own enjoyment. But this is a sort of mad philosophical thesis. I mean, it isn't, it, if you do anything testable on it, it's clear that they're not doing it for their own enjoyment. There's a confusion behind it, namely, uh, the theory here is called psychological egoism. And the confusion behind it is that a person will always have a reason for what they do, and that reason will be their reason. So in that sense, they're acting on their reason. But it doesn't mean that they're acting to promote their own good. That's a completely different issue. And altruism is just a fact of life. It's not as widespread as it ought to be, and one would hope there was more of it. But we can easily distinguish the people who are selfish in the bad sense from people who act on their own reasons. I mean, you can't act on somebody else's reason. So you do have your own reason. This doesn't make you selfish. But perhaps, I know what, I know what the woman is saying to us. She's perhaps selfish is too pejorative a term. Perhaps yeah. it has other meanings. Mm. Yes. Perhaps selfish can be good. Well, in the traditional sense of selfishness, where we think of selfishness as a vice, I don't think it can be good. There are often things brought up by people, though, that are perfectly reasonable things about self-respect. You know, the whole the women's movement has rightly uh, brought up the fact that uh, self-abasement amongst women and subordination of their own genuine interests to serving others all the time can actually be a kind of pathology. Uh, and that's right. I mean, there's a certain kind of self-respect and self-understanding uh, that we should actually promote as a virtue. But I wouldn't call that selfishness. Mm. See, I, I agree generally with the mm, proposition I do you too. made. Um, and I, I, it's amazing I don't, how I, this diseased view has become so prevalent. <laughs> Thank you, Will. <laughs> Let me comment on your yeah. remarks. <laughs> um, no, I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, 
dismiss so easily the calculus of self-interest. I mean, yeah. the difficulty is selfish is a loaded word which we regard as being a bad thing, yes. and altruism, of course, is a loaded word at the, right at the yeah. offset end yeah. of the spectrum, and it's a very good thing. But the idea that the martyr derives some satisfaction from their act of martyrdom makes perfect sense to me. And so you can't call martyrdom a selfless act. At least that's as I, as I see it. But that just means that the martyr has a reason for what they do. Mm. They wouldn't go ahead and do it if the, if the reason wasn't adequate to them. Sure. And, and that's true. And okay. so in that sense, it satisfies so, so something it is, in, their, in their makeup. Uh, so it, it can't be judged but it's as entirely Amanda. selfless. Yes, I think, I think this is where the Buddhist and the Christian models come into greatest conflict almost because... Um, the Buddhist definition of selfishness is self-harm and uh, the notion that unless you are happy you're of no use to anyone and so first you must achieve some degree of happiness before you can serve others and when you serve others you reinforce that happiness because you reinforce the connectedness and in fact the good old sort of positive social science surveys in the US show that on all the indicators of happiness uh, the people who are most happy are those who are most involved in community service. And uh, on that uplifting note, we're going to say goodbye because <laughs> you've got to go somewhere. I've got to read Simon Sharma because he's on tonight. And uh, I think... Provided it's pretty quick. OK. Thank you. Uh, this question is for uh, Tony. Uh, you claim to be a, a Catholic. I'm a Catholic too. But it seems that you... Uh, are very selective in what you want to uh, accept um, oh, yes. as yes, teachings right. of Christ and you are dismissive of uh, other things. Uh, you also mentioned that you are okay with, uh, uh, with people making a choice about um, dying. About dying. Yeah. Um, in other words, they choose uh, the time they want to die. How do you reconcile those views with, uh, with Christ's teachings, because I believe yes. that life has come from God, and therefore only God has the right to, to take that yes. life. You and I do not, uh, have not created that life, and therefore do not possess that life. It belongs to God. Well, it's hard to give a brief response to a question like that, but uh, I don't think, I think that what you think of as the Catholic tradition and the Catholic teaching uh, is deeply confused. I think that there are many Catholic traditions and the current line on a whole lot of issues to do with sex and uh, life and death issues and so on promulgated by the Vatican seems to me to be, first of all, largely incoherent and secondly, uh, not actually in uh, alignment with the scriptures or the tradition of the church by and large, which stretches over an enormous amount of time. I think that's all I can say in this brief canvas. Uh, <laughs>